O Lord Jesus Christ, who being subject to Mary and Joseph, didst sanctify home life with unspeakable virtues, grant that by the aid of both we may be taught the example of thy holy family and attain to eternal fellowship with it. Words taken from today's opening prayer for the Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Laura Vacunia was born in a place called Santiago, Chile, in the 19th century, the late 19th century. Laura Vacunia's father was named Joseph, and he was an accomplished military officer and came from a very good family that was part of the aristocracy. Laura's mother was named Mercedes, and she was a simple country girl who had fallen in love with a man in uniform. When Laura was still very young, a revolution and a civil war broke out in their homeland of Chile that forced the family to go into exile. And being a member of the nobility meant that Laura's father was a marked man, and the revolutionaries would kill him if they could get their hands on him. Being in political exile made life very challenging for the family, but things became even more difficult when the father, Joseph Acuna, suddenly died. Mercedes Facuña, the mother of the family, was now a widow, and Laura was now without a father. They would escape further away from the revolution in Chile by heading into Argentina, where Mercedes hoped to find work as a cook and a housekeeper. The desperate widow then made a most terrible moral choice. Mercedes had met a man named Manuel Mora, who owned a large ranch in an expensive hacienda, and a moral arrangement was made. When Senor Mora would agree to house and provide for the mother, Laura, and her other sister, but in exchange, Mercedes would agree to act as a mistress to Mr. Mora. With their tuition being paid for, for schooling by Senor Mora, Laura would eventually be sent off to a good Catholic school, where the sisters would teach her the holy faith. Laura began to thrive academically, and especially spiritually in that Catholic school. She loved the sisters very much, and she enjoyed attending the Holy Mass, going to confession, and making regular visits to our Lord in the Holy Tabernacle, which Laura called Jesus' little house. In fact, when Laura was first told that Jesus dwelt and always lived in that tabernacle, she blew him a kiss and promised to come back often for visits. Being in such a good boarding school and being inspired by such good consecrated religious sisters not only brought about a greater love for God, but also a greater love for neighbor in Laura. Laura became a friend to all other students, and she would always be the first to volunteer for chores. She was the consummate, the perfect peacemaker in the dormitory. Many describe Laura as being serious about life and wise beyond her age. She even had a mature understanding of prayer and brought a joyful spirit of piety wherever she went. As Laura once observed, quote, whenever I am, or rather wherever I am, at school, at play, or anywhere else, the thought of God accompanies me, helps me, and consoles me, unquote. But after the school year was over, Laura would have to return to that bad environment of Senor Mora's hacienda. Laura had taken catechism classes and studied the holy commandments with the sisters, and she knew that her mother was not living the right kind of life, but that her soul was darkened and was in danger of being lost. During her first summer vacation from school, Laura began to experience the unwanted advances of Senor Mora, drunk with whiskey. The master of the house would try to embrace and kiss Laura, but she would be repelled by his re behavior and sought to stay far, far away from him. When she was just 10 years old, Laura would receive her first Holy Communion, but this important event of her life, the most important event of her young life, she noticed that her mother did not receive the sacred host. The young daughter realized that her mother was most unhappy and that Laura would pray before the tabernacle saying, 
Jesus, I wish that Mama would know you better and become happy, unquote. After receiving the most blessed of all sacraments, Laura was further strengthened by grace and began to ponder seriously the religious life and becoming a consecrated religious sister. Laura would say to others around her, I want to do all I can to make God known and loved. My God, I want to love and serve you all my life. When Laura returned to school, she was able to speak to a visiting bishop about becoming a religious sister. The good bishop encouraged her, but told her that she would have to wait for a bit because she was still quite young. She was also told by her confessor that her call, her vocation to the religious life was real. It was genuine, but that it would have to be kept secret for a while. But when she got a bit older and asked the sisters to be admitted as a member of their order, Laura was told that it was not proper at this time, seeing that her mother was a public mistress living a scandalous life with Senor Mora. Another home visit, Laura once again was approached by the drunken Mr. Mora. He tried to take her into his arms, but she struggled ferociously, ran outside the home, and maintained her holy purity. During a special fiesta held in the local village a few days later, Senor Mora asked to dance with Laura, but she flatly refused him. The lustful man grew enraged and sought revenge. Laura was forced to hide outside the house in the dark all night while Mr. Moore vented his anger upon his mistress. The evil man then refused to pay her tuition for the schooling. But the good sisters heard of this difficulty and they took Laura back. And during that school year, Laura received the sacrament of confirmation. And with this new sacramental character and an increase of sanctifying grace, Laura would begin to embrace martyrdom. She realized that she did not as yet make that ultimate sacrifice for her mother, for the sake of her mother. Laura then begged her confessor that she be allowed to offer her life to God for the conversion of her mother. The priest, seeing her tremendous spiritual gifts present in this penitent, gave Laura permission to make the offering of her very life. In the winter of 1903, her martyrdom would begin. Laura became very, very ill in a mysterious way. Even a return home to the healthy climate and good air around the ranch did, did her no good. Her mother was saddened, but Senor Moore still had his lustful eyes upon her. Mercedes noted, that, noted this and soon took Laura and her sister away from the ranch and brought them into the local village. But in one night... In January of 1904, again a drunk Senor Mora, filled with anger and lust, rode into that village on horseback. And with the whip in his hand, he barged into the cottage where Mercedes and the girls were staying, and he demanded that his quote-unquote family return to his hacienda. Laura would have nothing to do with it. She would not have her mother return to that life of sin again. Despite her sickness... Laura Vicuña walked right outside the door. Senor Mora was furious. Laura tried to run to the sister's convent building, but she was quickly caught by Senor Mora. That man then began to whip her and then kicked her repeatedly as she lay on the ground crying for help. Laura had been beaten unconscious and left in the streets of that village. She would hang on to life for another week being watched over by her sister and her mother. The priest was called to give her the final sacraments, including a good confession where Laura clearly stated that she forgave her attacker and bore him no ill will. When Laura and her younger sister were alone, Laura made a series of requests that she wanted her sister to write down. Laura said, quote, be good to mama. Don't give her any trouble. Respect her always. Don't ever leave her. Even if later on you have your own family, don't look down upon the poor, but be kind to them. Love our God and the Blessed Virgin. Pray every day to your guardian angel to keep you from sin. And don't forget, sister, we will be together in heaven, unquote. Finally, just before she passed away from this world to heaven, Laura revealed her secret to her mother, 
Laura was only able to whisper, and so her mother had to lean very close to her lips. Laura then said, Mama, I'm dying, but I'm happy because I'm dying for you. I asked our Lord for this. Stunned by the statement, stunned from the statement from her daughter, Mercedes Vicuña fell to her knees and she sobbed uncontrollably. She realized what her daughter had meant and begged Laura's forgiveness as well as the forgiveness of God for having lived a life of sin with Senor Mora. She promised to begin her life anew. Blessed Laura Vicuña was beatified in March of 1988 and is the patron of all those who suffer abuse within the family. During the Holy Mass and ceremony that accompanied that beatification, the Holy Father referred to Laura as, quote, the Eucharistic flower of the Andes, whose life was a poem of purity, sacrifice, and filial love, unquote. Now, I must admit that I had never heard of Laura Vicuña or the details of her life and her suffering and her sacrifice. I only heard about her life due to her being invoked in a letter that was signed by a good archbishop from Astana, Pakistan, and as auxiliary bishop, the well-known and well-admired Most Reverend Athanasius Schneider. Blessed Laura, along with the great St. John the Baptist, Saints John Fisher and Thomas More, all saintly witnesses who died on account of their defense of marriage, all called upon in this letter to intercede that marriage and its indissolubility be protected from the errors and confusion caused by that infamous and problematic papal document known as Amoris Laetitia, as well as the various immoral pastoral practices being instituted officially in various dioceses regarding the sacraments of confession and Holy Communion being made available to those in objectively illicit unions. Once again, we're hearing from the faithful bishops, those two especially, the words of St. John the Baptist and other saintly witnesses saying, non licet, it is not lawful that thou shalt commit adultery. The letter in question then lists a number of non-negotiables. For example, quote, the relations between persons not bound by a valid, valid marriage, which in the case of divorced remarried, is always contrary to the will of God and is a grave offense against God, unquote. Blessed Laura Vicuña would agree with the other non-negotiables mentioned in the letter, including that moral imperative that, quote, it is not morally lawful to have relations with someone who is not thy rightful spouse in order to avoid another sin. Indeed, the word of God teaches that it is not lawful to do evil that good may come. The bishops then added that, quote, no circumstance, not even one that might lessen accountability or guilt, can ever make such illicit relations morally positive or somehow pleasing to God, unquote. Now, let's face it. Laura Vicuña's mother, Mercedes, found herself in a most difficult situation. A desperate widow with two small children who surrenders to the lusts of another in order to survive and to have her children cared for. But Laura's offering of herself as a victim soul show that this good daughter and the blessed Lord did not want this illicit behavior to continue despite the circumstances. The bishop's letter then adds that the practice of forbidding confession and Holy Communion to those in active adulterous unions is not so much a judgment about the internal state of the human soul of the persons involved. The church possesses no infallible gift to discern the subjective state of grace that might be in the believer. But rather, Holy Church and her ministers are judging the visible, public, and objective nature of the situation as one that is obviously adultery. And such a situation can only be cured by a separation of the two 
or at least a firm resolution and purpose to live in total continence, living as would a brother and sister. If adulterous couples were to be admitted to Holy Eucharist, if Mercedes and Signor Mora have been falsely accompanied and encouraged by a local pastor to approach the altar rail after a time of discernment, but not conversion, the faithful around them would be led into error regarding the teachings of marriage, including its indissolubility. Blessed Laura Vacunia offered her life to save the soul of her beloved mother. She did not compromise the Holy Gospel. She noted that her mother could not receive Holy Communion, for she was not right with the good Lord and needed to be healed. And Laura would be God's instrument in bringing about true conversion and perhaps the very salvation of her mother. For Blessed Laura of Acuna, the Holy Family was and still is the model and example for all spouses and families to follow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.